Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. Hope you all are doing well. It is a very bright and sunny day outside. I can look outside and it is sunny and bright and hot, which is a typical Texas summer. Fortunately, things are drying out along the Texas Gulf Coast and it's allowing people to get back into their homes after that horrifying hurricane. Um, a lot of them are coming home to, to nothing. They've lost everything. So if you're out there and you have the ability to, to help and make a donation, please go ahead and do it. I think the biggest mistake people often make when it comes to donating is that you think that what you can afford to give is not enough. And that's not true. A uh, million dollars donated by one person is no different than a million dollars donated by a million people. If everybody donated a dollar, if there was a million of you, you would make the same size donation as somebody who can maybe afford to donate a million dollars or more. So I would uh, I would suggest to you all that any amount you can give or anything you can give, you should do it because I can promise you it, it of course makes a difference to those in need, but it will make a difference to you. You'll feel so much better about yourself. I promise you there is something uh, euphoric about giving. And and even if it's what you can, even if it's a little bit, it will make a difference in your life. I promise you. All right. I'm Dinosaur George. Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast slash Dinosaur George video cast. If you listen to my podcast uh, uh, audio, I hope that you will follow me on iTunes and if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, I hope that you will give it a like and that you'll subscribe and, and share it with other people. I hope you'll be willing to do that because that will help kind of spread the word. And that is what makes it for me. If I can get a lot of viewers and a lot of listeners, then it will give me more incentive to continue to record these uh, whenever I can. Uh, if, if, if it's not reaching a lot of people at some point, it, you know, it just becomes, it's just not worth, uh, it's not worth making it the priority. I still do it because I enjoy it, but it, I would be able to, uh, to put more attention to doing it on my list of priorities because it would be, it would be worthwhile doing it. Um, for people that maybe are new to the podcast or the video cast, I, I, I'm just I'll say this again. I've said this the last three, but I just want to rehash it one more time. We have a store. It is at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. And we have marked down our products anywhere from 20 to 50%. It's a great opportunity. If you want to buy something, I sell replica claws and teeth and skulls and bones and that kind of stuff. I don't sell authentics, but I sell replicas. But if you're interested in getting something, Things are going pretty quick. We, we've sold out of a lot of really big stuff, but we still have some stuff left that's pretty cool. So if you're interested or if you have somebody in the family who uh, you might want to drop an early Christmas hint to, because I can tell you some of these things won't be here at Christmas time. Things like the Velociraptor skulls, the T-Rex skulls, the saber tooth cats are going fast. I think we only have one Utah Raptor foot left, and that's cool. I think we have one Allosaurus hand left maybe. I saw just this morning, we sold the last of the giant dog skulls. So uh, anyway, if, you, if you're if you interested in something, I hope you get a chance to go there and maybe find something that you like. All right. The focus animal of this episode is going to be Megalodon. I love Megalodon. I've always loved Megalodon. It's the giant shark. For those of you that may not be familiar with it, I think most of you are. Megalodon was a giant shark that is similar in in the way it's drawn as a great white so it looks a lot like a great white shark now the name megalodon in english means big tooth and it appeared in the miocene and lived up to about the end of the pliocene and that was anywhere from 23 million to about two and a half million years ago so it was around a long time it's a very successful shark and it's distributed almost worldwide you uh, we find their teeth everywhere now with sharks uh most sharks the only thing that we find in the fossil record are the teeth 
And that's it, because that's the only thing that fossilizes in most instances. There are some prehistoric sharks where we find a, um, a, a vertebra that is still, it was made of cartilage, but they can fossilize. And once in a while that happens with the big ones. There's some smaller prehistoric sharks that you find those vertebra run all the way down the length from the back to the tail. We find all of them. So some of them had at least bone-like structures that could fossilize. But in sharks, in, in the vast majority, it is only the teeth. And that leaves you with the problem of which family does the shark belong to if all you have to look at is its tooth. And second of all, how big is the animal if you don't have any bones to estimate the size? So... This is a shark that is known only by its teeth. And maybe, I did maybe see something once where somebody found the fossilized first vertebra from a megalodon, I think, that it actually became fossilized. It, it went through a process. I, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure it was a megalodon. Well, if indeed they found a fossilized vert that, and again, that vertebra used to be cartilage, just like the end of your nose, just like your ears. That's what their body is made of. If, if in fact, one of them was preserved, that would give us a much better idea of size, I'm pretty sure. Um, most of us know this shark as Carcharodon Megalodon. Carcharodon is, is like his first name. Megalodon is his last name. Um, uh, Carcharodon is the genus. Megalodon is the species. And so um, there's there's been argument in the science community over whether or not that is the correct genus to put it in is a carcharodon because there's another group of sharks called carcaracles and i believe the consensus among scientists now is that it is carcaracles megalodon is the proper genus and species name but i'll just refer to it as megalodon because everybody knows it at that now megalodon is considered the largest carnivorous animal that ever existed vertebrate animal that ever existed and or at least I've always claimed it to be the biggest, but a good friend of mine, a guy named Sal Scabetta, Sal's a, Sal's a great guy. This guy is an expert on reptiles, but he also just studies animals in general. And he and I were talking one day and I, I made the comment, yeah, Megalodon's the biggest carnivore that ever lived. And Sal said, well, wait a minute, isn't the blue whale the biggest carnivore? And I thought, you know, I never thought about it like that. When we think of carnivores, we always like to think of an animal that's chasing something and killing it, and, and blue whales are just swimming around with their mouth open catching krill. Well, okay, a lion is an animal that runs around with its mouth open and catches zebras. A crocodile is an animal that sits there with his mouth open and catches wildebeest. So, yes, I guess technically the blue whale, all size measurements of the blue whale exceed the biggest measurements I've ever seen of, of megalodon. So I guess the blue whale would be the largest carnivorous animal, but Megalodon is certainly among the biggest, bigger than any meat-eating dinosaur known. So Megalodon is a monster. Now, when I talk about the size of this animal, I've seen estimates between 18 meters to 25 meters, and that's like 59 feet to 85 feet, and that's a big, big difference in size. So you say, well, if all we have are the teeth to go measure, how can we possibly give a realistic size estimate of the animal? Well, there, if, if I understand this correctly, and, and I may be wrong, I remember being told of a formula, a basic formula that using great white sharks, this works with. If you take the largest tooth in the mouth, which I believe is the upper center tooth, left or right, upper top tooth, that represents the biggest tooth in the shark. And there are ways you can tell whether you're looking at that tooth or you're looking at one of the teeth further down the jaw because as you go down to the jaw to the corner of the mouth, the teeth become progressively smaller. But they also have a different shape to them. So if you find a tooth that you can identify as the biggest tooth in the mouth, then if you use a, if you measure from the very tip of that tooth, down the edge to the bottom, you know, their teeth are shaped like a triangle. And if you measure from the top to the bottom, for every inch of tooth, that represents 10 feet of shark. So if I found a one inch tooth from the upper front of the mouth of a megalodon, if it was one inch, that would suggest that that shark was 10 feet long. 
If I found a three inch tooth, it would mean the shark is 30 feet long, five inch tooth, 50 feet, and so on and so forth. So if that is accurate, the biggest tooth I've ever seen was five and three quarter inches, almost six inches long. That's nearly a 60 foot shark. But I saw the broken bottom of a tooth that was found. All that was found was the bottom. And it truly was two times the size of the same section of tooth on a five inch tooth. So if that tooth, if you can extrapolate from that, that that might have been a 10 inch tooth. And maybe if that formula of an inch per tooth is or an inch per 10 feet is accurate, that's a hundred foot long shark. So you can understand the variation between 59 feet and going all the way up into the 80, 85 feet range because different people have different opinions of how to estimate the size. But the jaws were gigantic and they could exert something like 40,000 pounds per square inch of bite force. That is enormous. But you need that to be able to bite through the thickness of something like a whale. And there's fossil evidence that shows that whale vertebra oftentimes have very deep wounds in them that can be attributed to megalodons because of the shape and and uh, markings the tooth left behind. Um, oh, let me tell you a great story. I've seen this picture probably a thousand times. People always send me this picture of this big whale vertebra with this megalodon tooth that looks like it's been hammered right into the end of it. It almost looks like King Arthur's sword. <laughs> like whoever can pull the megalodon tooth is king of the sea. Um, and now... In all fairness to whoever owns the piece, and that might be a legitimate fossil. I don't want to disparage it, but I've seen so many fake fossils in my life. My first reaction was, why would that shark be biting that vertebra that way? If you're attacking the animal, the vertebra are going lengthwise and you're coming across and biting into them. You're not biting. Your jaw doesn't go through the back of the whale. Now, it's possible maybe if the whale had, was dead or dying and was sinking, maybe it just grabs it in an odd position and its tooth goes down the center. But uh, I'll tell you guys a great story about fake fossils. This, I love this. Uh, back in 1980, 80, not 80, in, in 98, I get those two confused. Back in 98, I think it was, I opened a store and I used to sell fossils. And I had this guy come in and he ha- came in with a, with a, with a cow bone with a, uh, a arrowhead stuck in the side of it. And I could look, I looked at the cow bone. I saw the cow bone had been stained. I could see it was stained, household stain to make the bone look older. And the arrowhead was made of obsidian. Well, obsidian is what they make those really cheap replica arrowheads down in Mexico out of. You can buy them for a quarter a piece down there. This guy comes in with this thing and he goes, look, man, I found this prehistoric buffalo with this arrowhead in it. And I'm wondering if you want to buy it. I said, where did you find it? He goes right outside of San Antonio. Well, right off the bat, I knew the guy was totally lying because obsidian isn't indigenous to San Antonio. So immediately I knew the guy was a liar, but I'm like, no, no, thank you. I'm not interested in this thing. So he left about 20 minutes later. This other guy walks in and he has the same thing. And he goes, Hey, how much do you think this is worth? And I said, Please tell me you didn't buy this from some guy in my parking lot. He goes, no, I got it from a guy who's selling, sold it to me at uh, down at this gym and mineral show going on downtown. He said, it's the only one he's ever found. I said, well, he's a liar because another guy was in here with one just five minutes ago or 10 minutes ago. And it's the same thing. I said, look, and I showed it to him. And I said, if you look closely where the arrowhead goes into the bone, do you notice that it's been cut with some kind of saw? like a Dremel tool it's perfectly cut off. And then the arrowhead is shoved in. I said, look at the back of the arrowhead. You can see where he hammered and, and made an indentation on the back where he hammered it into the bone. And I said, and then more importantly, this thing's stained. This is a cow bone. It's not a, it's not a Buffalo bone. It's a cow bone. So he was pretty infuriated and he accused me of being a liar. And he accused me of, no, you're just saying that because you're jealous. You don't own it. Well, as luck would have it, a lady walks in the store and, and she's holding one. And I said, wow, another one of a kind. Third one today. 
And and she said, I bought this from a guy down at this gym show, and he said it's the only one he'd ever seen. He had it under the counter, and when I walked up, he pulled it out and showed it to me and then put it away real fast, and I went in and bought it. I said, well, that guy's a scammer. So at least those two jumped in their cars and went back down and went back to the gym show. I hope they beat the guy up. So anyway, I'm inclined to believe that the that the famous sword in the stone slash tooth in the vert is probably man-made but but i i can't say with any certainty but if you want to look it up go online and look at look up a megalodon tooth and whalebone and you'll see what i'm talking about you'll see that picture all right so those teeth are incredibly sharp and very thick and very powerful so that they could bite into bone if if they needed to and when they needed to because these sharks are hunting things like whales. Whales are definitely on the menu, but so are walruses and seals and dolphins, all the pinnipeds. They're, they're, they're hunting all of that, all the big sea life, plus probably sea turtles. And they would need those kind of jaws to be able to powerful teeth and jaws to bite through all the bone and, and shell. So one last story about Megalodon, because this is, this will demonstrate how sharp those teeth are. There was a family from South America whose children they sent to San Antonio, and I taught them for a week, taught them about paleontology for a week. And to show me their appreciation, they sent me this beautiful megalodon tooth that had been found in Chile, I believe. Beautiful tooth. And they sent it to me as a thank you. And and I was very appreciative. I took my thumb and I just ran it down the length of the serrated edge. I don't know why, but I did. And that thing sliced my finger open as if they took it out of the shark yesterday. Those teeth, that's a 20 million year old tooth and it was still that sharp. So anyway, those teeth were absolutely terrifyingly sharp. Now, here are the two questions that I don't know the answer to when it comes to Megalodon. How big did they really get? And what would be the reason for their extinction? Let's start with how big did they really get? Here's why I pose this question. The, the smaller sharks, the juveniles and the subadults, were spending their time along the shoreline, much closer to shore, because they were smaller. Therefore, they could swim in and around smaller areas without the fear of getting stuck, beached. But also, whales aren't along the shoreline close in. So they're not hunting whales when they're little. They're hunting seals and dolphins and animals that would have stayed closer to shore. So... That means that the water that at one time covered places like California and, and North Carolina, well, that those oceans have receded, and now we can walk along and find their teeth on the land. And that means they're much easier to find because more people are looking, more people are out there, more people are likely to see it. But the really big megalodon teeth, the ones that belong to the giants, those would still be much further out, still covered by the ocean. And so I pose the question, how big can they get by posing this? Are we really finding the bigger shark teeth or are what we finding are subadult and juvies? Are those what we're really finding? And perhaps the giant megalodons, the ones that maybe grew to a hundred feet in length, if that's possible, maybe their teeth are so far out, it is almost impossible to find them because you know, all the growth over the, the, the teeth themselves, you have oysters building reefs on them and that sort of stuff. But also there's, you know, a fraction of the number of people can go put on dive gear and go look for megalodon teeth than the general public. And you have limitations of time and you have, you can't, you, you can't see as much and, and you know, you're, you're less likely to be eaten by a great white shark on the shore as you are looking for his ancestors teeth or his cousin's teeth uh, in the ocean. So, my question is, could they have reached 80, 90, 100 feet? Do you think that's possible? And second question, why did they die out? Now, there's there's a couple of different ideas as to why they died out. These are not my ideas, by the way. These I've read. Uh, one is that orca seem to be becoming more popular, the, the killer whales. Orca hunt in groups. Megalodons are like other sharks. They're probably hunting individually, and they're certainly not cooperating with each other to defend one another. So that would give orcas a, a, an absolute advantage over megalodon. Now, maybe an orca is not going to eat an adult megalodon, but he's going to kill the young. And where do orcas hunt? As much in the deep ocean as they do in the shallows, which puts them in and among the young and the juvies and the sub-adults, those which they're capable of killing. So maybe it was attrition. 
you just continue to pick them off few, little by little. And the next thing you know, there's no breeding population left. That could be one reason. Or, uh, and then there's another one, and that is the rise of the toothed whales. Brigmaphyceter shigensis is a whale that comes to mind. Um, uh, the sperm whales. Those guys certainly have the ability to defend themselves. And what was the other guy? Leviathan or Leviathan? Something. Melvin, Melvini? Uh, the giant toothed whale, right? There's another one. One of you will, will tell me who it is because I can never remember these names, but you guys do. You're smarter than me. Um, but there's another toothed whale. So maybe it was the rise of the toothed whales and the orcas that led to their demise. But here is my hypothesis. And let me preface this by saying I don't have any scientific evidence to support what I'm going to say other than modern animals. Sharks draw their oxygen from the sea, from the water. The warmer the temperature, the less oxygen molecules are available. Warm water doesn't have as much oxygen in it. Cold water has more. If you're a big animal like an adult megalodon, you require a certain percentage of oxygen to be able to just do the normal things you do, like swim and chase and reproduce and hunt and eat and all those things. Whales, on the other hand, a food source of megalodons, don't have such limitations. They have the ability to travel into much warmer water because they're drawing their air from the outside. The temperature of the water is irrelevant when it comes to oxygen. So you have a whale who's capable of supporting his mass by breathing outside air, but you have a shark who may be, um, may, may be hindered by his size when he moves into warmer weather, uh, warmer water water so what if the whales migrated longer and more often to warmer environment water where they are less likely to encounter their main predator now the flip side to that of course is the warmer the water the you have a limitation on food availability so a whales got to have a certain amount of plankton and krill and whatever it is they eat so it's not like they could do this all the time but i'm just thinking out loud what if they did that as a way to be able to escape the sharks. And if the sharks couldn't follow, if my hypothesis has any credibility and the sharks were unable to follow, that would mean that the sharks, the sharks aren't like cold blooded reptiles. The sharks need to feed more often when you're that big. And especially if your body is trying to keep the temperature warm enough for your cold water. Um, I think they've got to feed much more often than say a reptile, a cold blooded reptile. And if that's the case, you get to the point where you need to eat anything as a food source. So maybe you come together with the initial idea of finding a girlfriend or having kids, but you suddenly realize you're hungry and that guy looks cute, but he would look cuter if he was lunch. So, so those kind of things may have ultimately teamed together to that attrition caused the extinction, not some big massive event. We often think of extinction as some big gigantic cataclysmic event, but that's not the case. So maybe they were dying out gradually simply because of competition or maybe because of food sources not being as readily available. And here's my last word on Megalodon. I owe an apology and a public apology to a lot of people. When movies like Jurassic Park and Jurassic World came out, people within the paleontological community were furious because of the scientific inaccuracies. And I said, give it a rest. It's fiction. It's fiction. And I couldn't understand why they were so mad. In my opinion, the good that came from those movies so far outweighs the bad. People found a renewed interest in dinosaurs. Now they're donating to museums. They're going to museums. They're funding the very science that these scientists study. So I couldn't understand their frustration. Now, to one point I did, because a lot of their opinion was, look, man, so make it fictional. But make it factual based. How hard is that? They have a good point. That's a good point. Why would you make Ceratosaurus or Dilophosaurus spit venom? Why do that? When Ceratosaurus is such a wicked looking dinosaur in the first place. Why do that? I understood that. But in general, I disagreed with them that they're getting all upset over nothing. Then Discovery Channel comes out with this Megalodon mockumentary. Not documentary, but mockumentary. It's a complete farce. But it was designed to look like a documentary. It was presented as fact. When it came out, I 
tried to look at the bright side and I said, well, think about how many people now are going to know about Megalodon and my friends in the paleo world are going, no, there's nothing good about this. Well, after years of having people come up to me and saying, you do know, don't you, that Megalodons are still alive. I have come to the conclusion that, boy, was I wrong. And I owe people an apology for saying, man, you guys need to calm down. You don't need to calm down. Scientists have a role, and that role is to ensure the scientific accuracy of what's presented to the public as fact. And since this mockumentary was designed to be factual, they were absolutely correct. This show did all kinds of harm. Now, is it possible that a shark as big as Megalodon still exists? Yes, of course, it's possible. The ocean is a big place. But there is no factual evidence, not emotion, not emotional evidence of I heard from a friend, from a friend, from a friend, or I saw a YouTube video. Not that kind of evidence. I mean, real evidence. We don't see whales with gashes. You know, not every shark is going to kill its prey. You always see you see seals a lot with missing flippers and big wounds that can be attributed to shark attack. We would be seeing whales with that. We would see carcasses washing up on the beach. We have submarines from every military, from every country on the planet who has submarines traversing every inch of the ocean. We would pick up, there, there would be a signature on sonar. There would, there's so much mapping of the ocean. There's so much, we've seen so much of the ocean. I hear people tell me, you know, we know more about the f- face of the moon than we do about the ocean. No, we don't. No, we don't. We know more about the ocean than we do about the moon. Um, We've mapped it. There's hundreds of these rovers going down, deep sea probes, all this stuff. We would be seeing something. Again, the ocean is a big place. I will admit that it's certainly possible that uh, that uh, Megalodon or something like it could still exist. I'll admit that that's possible, but I do not believe that it is likely. All right, I'm going to take a little short break, and when I come back, I'm going to answer questions submitted by readers on my podcast page and viewers on YouTube. So stick around. Would you like to buy fossil replica skulls, teeth, claws, and more? Then visit our catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. We sell replicas rather than real fossils so that we don't deplete the resources. Our replicas and casts are museum quality and look real, but are much more affordable. From dinosaurs to ice-aged mammals to modern animal skulls, there is something for everyone. Visit our online catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection of amazing Amazing fossil replicas today. All right. This first question is one that came in through our Skype phone line. He didn't leave a name, but I know for sure. I know this is my buddy Alex. I know it's my friend Alex. Alex is a friend of mine on on uh, Facebook, and and uh, Facebook. Let me explain Facebook again. When I started my first Facebook page, I, I started two pages. One is the Dinosaur George page. And the other was my personal page, the George Blassing, B-L-A-S-I-N-G. On my George Blassing page, I just post jokes and humor and videos and observations. Not much to do with dinosaurs. That's just my personal page. It's my personal escape from, uh, from you know, re- the world. Then my Dinosaur George page is where I post dinosaur-related stuff. Well, as people searched for me, they were searching for me by my name. And the next thing I know... I reached the maximum amount of friends on my personal page, the 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 uh, George Blassing page. I, I've reached 5,000, and I can't accept any more. But you can follow me on that page if you just want to have fun and, and join in the fun that goes on there. Um, there's something like another, I don't know, 10,000 followers or something. So it's a, it's a popular page. If you want to follow me on Facebook, you can follow me on both. You can follow me on the George Blassing page and you can follow me on the Dinosaur George page. And, and usually you see to, two totally different things. Um, well, my friend Alex is is one of the people that follows me on my George Blassing page. And Alex has asked me a dozen times if he could come on the show and talk about Allosaurus. And I promised him I would. Alex, one of these days I will do that, my friend. So if this is in fact you, Alex, uh, I just want you to know that that I appreciate you taking time to to call and leave your message. If it isn't Alex, whoever it is that called in the question, it's a good question. So let's hear his question. Hi, George. I was wondering how did Allosaurus cope with this environment, and um, which 
That's a group that outsource hunt the most. Thanks. Oh, that's a great question. And again, I'm, I'm almost sure it's you, Alex. That's a, those are two good questions. How did it cope with its environment? Well, like other animals, Alex, this uh, Allosaurus would have been capable of handling probably almost anything that came up. Like as Stegosaurs figured out ways to utilize their weapons, Allosaurus would have been able to figure out a way to maybe hunt cooperatively. One Allosaurus against one Stegosaurus is not a good fight for the Allosaurus. Too much possibility of being hurt. Two Allosauruses hunting cooperatively have a much greater chance of making the kill and getting away without being injured. So that's an example, Alex, of a way that um, Allosaurus could adapt or survive in his environment by maybe coming up with ways to hunt cooperatively. There's other ways. Let's say that... um, Let's say that uh, it begins to rain, like there's a change in the weather and it begins to rain a lot. Well, a way that an Allosaurus could adapt to that is maybe nest in an area that's further higher elevation where the flooding won't wipe out its eggs. So that way it can continue to perpetuate its species. So there's lots of ways that those animals can adapt. And I think they would have done the same thing that other animals do today. And that is figure out what works best. And the most successful Allosaurus is the ones that survive. And those are the ones that take their genes into the next generation. As for your other question, who did they hunt the most? Another brilliant question, Alex. I believe they were probably focusing on young camera sources because those were some of the most common dinosaurs back then. I think camera source would have been a main food source. I think Stegosaurus would have been the secondary food source because they could protect themselves probably better than a camerasaurus so i would say and then maybe things like camptosaurus is probably another very good food source because camptosaurus didn't have the weaponry to be able to really defend itself so my guess would be probably juvenile camerasaurus because they were everywhere most popular common dinosaur back then then i think juvie and maybe young uh, stegosaurus and then maybe camp to source. Thank you so much for writing to me, my friend. And I hope, uh, I hope one of these days I'll get you on and we'll do an interview with you. All right, Corey from Rizal, Philippines. I have two questions about my favorite dinosaur, Ceratosaurus. Does it use its horn to kill prey? And question number two, why did you give it a bad role in Jurassic Fight Club? My friends laugh at Ceratosaurus now because of Jurassic Fight Club. And he writes, hashtag Ceratosaurus lives matter. <laughs> Oh, Oh, Corey, that's great, man. All right. So (laughs) does it use its horn to to kill its prey? I don't believe so, Corey. I don't think they were heavy enough to cause any sort of major injury. Plus, a blade on his nose is relatively thin um, uh, cross-section, so it would have been broken. I think those were ornamental more than anything. I think they were used to be able to to act as a display to recognize uh, the species. So I don't think they were weapons. Uh, why did I give it a bad role in Jurassic Fight Club? Well, in order to do a show about it, I needed to put it against an animal that would have lived within its environment, and that was Allosaurus. Because there have been places where Ceratosaurus and Allosaurus fossils were found together. When I wrote the show, I always wrote it around something that was science-based, that those two were found together, same quarry, so therefore I felt comfortable to be able to claim they would have come in contact with each other. That's how I, that's how I arrived at it. So Allosaurus, just unfortunately for for Ceratosaurus, two things. One, he's my favorite dinosaur. You knew Allosaurus was going to win, Corey. I mean, you knew that. But the other is that Allosaurus was so advanced over Ceratosaurus. So I am so apologetic for for, uh, uh, doing that against poor Ceratosaurus. It's not fair to him by any stretch. He should have uh, gotten more love. So I'm very sorry for not uh, giving him the props that I should have and making him the laughing stock. All right, Riley from Canada. Sup, DG? Sup, Riley? How's it going? It's going good, Riley. Riley says, I'd like to know why the dinosaurs in Jurassic Fight Club didn't have feathers along with other inaccuracies. And then he said, wouldn't raptor feathers aid in balance so that the outcome of a battle would be different, for example? Also, what are your opinions of the amazing dinosaur train? Okay, first of all, dinosaur train, I actually like it a lot. I like it because at least it's based on facts. I like it a lot. And they picked a great spokesperson. um, uh, uh, Oh my gosh, his name just escaped me, Sam. Um, 
right, Sam? Gosh, how could I have done that? That's horrible. Anyway, the paleontologist that they use in there, he is, he is perfect for that role. The guy does a great job. Uh, and so I like Dinosaur Train a lot. I actually like it a lot. Obviously, it's designed, you know, for younger audience to learn about dinosaurs, but I find it to be a very, very good show. Now, back to why didn't they have feathers? It all comes down to two things, three things, Riley. One, we didn't own the show. We're at the mercy of the, of the, of the people that own it, which is the History Channel. Two, feathers cost a lot of money to animate a lot because you can't make them stiff and not move because then the animal doesn't look real you have to animate every feather you have to make each feather move independent of each other and the time it takes to do that is incredible and the expense to do it is unimaginable think about jurassic world the budget that they had compared to jurassic fight club they had more budget for their show we could have done a hundred seasons of Jurassic Fight Club for what they had. But even within their budget, they didn't completely feather their raptors. And it all has to do with expense. And then the other problem is time. You have limitations when you have to have these done. You can't get around to deadlines when you're dealing with television shows because everything, everything is, is everything you know, it is based around having your show ready when they want it to air. So because of those things, that's why you saw a lot of inaccuracies and that's why you saw no feathers. Now, whether or not the feathers would have aided in balance, certainly if there were feathered big feathers on the arms that could have been used, utilized for balance, absolutely could have been a very effective way to be used for balance. So if you had a non arm feathered Raptor and an arm feathered Raptor, who would have the advantage? It would be the guy with the feathers because the balance sort of like walking across a tightrope. You have that big pole to be able to use for balance. Well, imagine having built in tightrope pole on each arm, only you've got giant claws. So those are very good questions, Riley. Thank you so, so much for writing. Uh, Julie from Lubbock. Oh, my friend, Julie. Hey, Dinosaur George, I'm back with a new question. Well, good, Julie. I'm glad to hear from you. She said, your episode on dinosaurs in extreme weather got me thinking. And she puts in parentheses, I love studying weather. I do too, Julie. I find it fascinating. She says, do you think taller dinosaurs had issue with lightning strikes? Wow. Lightning can strike miles from a storm, so there might not be any initial warning for them, especially if the danger was from pop-up thunderstorms like that are so familiar here in Texas. Julie, what a great point. Why didn't I think about this? You're right, man. If your head is the highest thing in the area... And lightning can strike miles from its source. Man, I bet you they did deal with that. I bet they did. Now, of course, there's a lot of debate whether uh, hadrosaurs raise or sauropods raise their head as high as we think. But when it's things like Brachiosaurus and Paralatite and those guys, they, they, I don't think they walked around with their head low to the ground. I don't think it's physically possible. Their heads are up there. And I've never been one that bought into this idea that their heads are low. Your food source is up. Why would, why would you evolve such a long neck if not to reach up to your food source? I think that one of the mistakes we make in paleontology is sometimes we desperately try to disprove the obvious. Nothing wrong with that. You know, what, what appears obvious doesn't make it uh, scientifically factual, but certainly, you know, that would be like saying a giraffe would feed by splaying his legs and lowering his head. And that's how he eats. It doesn't make any sense to me. So um, I think that their heads would have been up in the air. And that leads to your question, Julie. I don't know, but in my opinion, I have no doubt, no doubt whatsoever that they would have been dealing with lightning strikes. Ooh, the smell of barbecued dinosaur. It smells like victory. Okay, Mohammed from Oslo, Norway. Hi, Dinosaur George. I have a question. Would Dinosuchus beat T-Rex if they met? Well, Mohammed, good to hear from you, my friend. I think if the fight was in the water, yes. If the fight was on land, no. Now, out in Big Bend, Texas, the state that I live in, Texas, out in an area called Big Bend, we find Dinosuchus and we find Tyrannosaurus Rex living side by side. These guys are, are interacting. They're seeing each other. Um, I think they probably kept a respectful distance from each other, but at some point in time, they are going to come in contact with each other. I think if the fight was in deeper water, let's say a Tyrannosaur walks out into the water to get a drink. He doesn't want to lean over and drink by the shore. He wants to walk out. We see a lot of animals prefer to walk into the water to drink, not just drink from the shore. Um, 
had he done something like that and if a crocodile was there then i don't think tyrannosaurus would have stood a chance because he just doesn't have the the body design to be able to fight in, in an aquatic a battlefield but if it was on land i think tyrannosaurus would have been more than capable of breaking that thing's neck but what a fight that would have been okay michael from thunder bay ontario canada hi dinosaur george it's me michael once more michael nice to hear from you again uh, michael said i have another question uh just like how male elephants today go into muth would the same had happened with male triceratops well with with the muth what m- must pronounce must but spelled m-u-s-t-h what that is, if you're not familiar with it, is during the mating season, bull elephants kind of have a chemical change to their body. You see by their eyes, kind of close to their eyes, they have what looks like stains, like tears running down. That's actually a, a pheromone that tells the females they're ready for mating and it tells the males, I'm looking for a fight. These male elephants become very aggressive. It is the time of the year that you want to beat up anybody in the area so you earn the right to be uh the one that mates of the females would triceratops have done that well clearly reptiles go through the same male combat rituals during mating season they go through the same kind of thing birds go through the same thing almost all animals fish go through this time and so the only question would be would they ooze that pheromone that smell that kind of makes everybody around them aware of their emotion. That's that's maybe that may be possible, may not be. I mean, female snakes can admit a pheromone when they're ready to reproduce, so they have the ability within the species to do it. My best guess would be yes, or something very close to it. All right, Doug from San Diego, California. Uh, would an adult Parasiritherium be indestructible at that enormous size, or would there still be predators big enough back then to be able to kill it? I personally don't think so, but what do you think about it? Well, Doug, what a fine uh, observation. Parasiritherium, some people know them as Beluchotherium, some people know them as Dendrocotherium. It's a gigantic rhinoceros-looking thing. Um, they are so enormous that I am unaware of anything big enough to be able to kill them. But nature has a way to maintain the um, balance of, of nature. Nature finds a way. Nature is going to figure out a way to kill them, Doug. So it may not be, was there something big enough to kill them? Maybe at that age, they became more susceptible to disease. Maybe disease killed the bigger ones and maybe younger ones had more of an immunity to it. There's no evidence for this. I'm just, I'm just pointing this out to, to in answer to your question, Doug. Maybe when you're really big, you've got other issues to contend with, like the ability to move, osteoporosis, the degradation of your knee joints. All of those things may have been things that would have hindered their ability to survive much beyond that big size. So maybe nature took care of it. I am unaware of any predator, any predator that could take on an adult. I just don't think it exists, but I do believe, and and there's one other way I think that their numbers could have been kept in check. And that is maybe the young were only born once uh, a year or every 18 months or every 24 months and so few of them were being born that they never had such high numbers that they were able to deforest an entire area there's a number of ways that they could have been in check but to your question the answer for me is no i am unaware of anything that could have taken them on all right jackson from fayetteville arkansas hey dg i appreciate what you do and i hope you're doing well jackson thank you very much that's very kind of you i appreciate you taking the time to write to me so jackson says could parasaurolophus have used its hollow crest to resonate extremely low frequency sounds to blast at a predator to damage their ear bones or ears and give it a chance to run away well yeah i mean maybe maybe Sound is a great weapon. There's animals that use sound as a weapon. Um, I, I I used to have an aquarium, and every day I'd go in there, and one of my fish would be dead. Couldn't figure out what was doing it. Found out later it was a pistol shrimp. A pistol shrimp is a little tiny shrimp that can snap his claws together so quickly he can reproduce the concussiveness of a 22 caliber bullet. 
And if these fish came near his home, he would snap that thing and stun them to death, knock them cuckoo and kill them. So sound can be used. Now, I am unaware of any studies that would that would uh, suggest that they had the ability to do it. I do think that they would have been able to utilize their uh, that that big crest to make low frequency sound. Whether or not it could be converted into a weapon, I don't know. But that's an interesting question. Even if it was used just to startle them, you know, like hissing cockroaches, they make noise to startle you. Snakes can hiss and make noise to startle you. A lot of animals, even lower animals. Uh, lower intellect animals have the ability to utilize sound as a way to to defend themselves. So maybe they use it, if nothing else, to scream at you, to scare you, so they have time to take off running. I don't know. But that's a very interesting question, Jackson, and thank you for writing. All right, Zachary from Oro Valley, Arizona. Zachary says, why was the USA able to support the existence of so many large predators like the short-faced bear, Smilodon, the American lion, Homotherium, dire wolves, America cheetahs, and American jaguars? This is a great observation. Basically, how can so many major predators inhabit one continent? Well, First, we have to realize the the size and scope. But let's forget about the continent. Let's say almost everything you just mentioned all lived in and around from California to Arizona to Texas. So let's just look at that. How did this many big animals live? Here's how, I think, Zachary. Two, one, availability of food sources. If there is enough food to be divided up equally or necessary for each to get the necessary intake, then you can have more carnivores. You can have more carnivores because the ecosystem supports them. The other would be how they divide up their food source. You see, if I am, um, if I'm good at catching horses and that's what I eat, then that's my food. But if I'm bigger and I can't catch a horse, but I can catch a bison, bison becomes my food. So here immediately we have two giant predators living side by side, but they're not competing necessarily with one another. I believe that it was the availability of food that was able to sustain these, but that comes with a price. And that price is that when things get tough and the ecosystem changes and the slightest variation in available food source appears, then I think what happens is now you have a very big problem, and that problem is there ain't enough food to go around, and so then you begin to not tolerate the other guy. All right, you guys, that is it for this show. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I've enjoyed answering your questions as always. I get a big thrill out of reading these, and I wish I had more time. I have been able to contact a couple of different paleontologists uh, that I'm hoping to interview for some upcoming shows uh, because I know it's fun to, to hear from the people that are out, actually out there digging. If there's anybody in particular you would like to hear from, if you know of somebody, and it doesn't have to just be paleontology, if you want to talk about uh, ancient Indians, if you want to talk about the Egyptians or geology, archaeology, the stars, the weather, I'm happy to talk about anything on this podcast, anything that helps spread uh, science, because that's the goal of this podcast is spreading science. Um, If you follow me on Facebook, I hope you do. If you don't, like I said, you can go to the George Blassing page and follow me there or look up Dinosaur George on Facebook and follow me there. I have a Twitter account. I think it's under Dinosaur George. I think you can find it there. If not, if you go to my podcast page, which is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com, you will see actual links to all of these different places so you don't have to look them up yourself. It has a link to my Facebook page. It has a link to my uh, uh, to my um, um, YouTube uh, page uh, channel. It has it has links to all of that stuff. If you don't want to have to search for them yourself, for everybody out there that lives in and around the Houston or Gulf Coast area, I wish you guys the best, and I hope you recover quickly. And I hope, more importantly, you're all safe. The possessions you can replace, but it is your safety and it's your well being 
that can't be replaced. So I hope you you do that. If you can donate a little bit, there's a lot of different places that are accepting donations. I hope you will consider it, even if it's the minimal amount you can give, even if it's a dollar or five dollars. I promise you it will make you feel better about yourself and about helping other people. Be kind to the people around you. Be friendly to the people around you. Don't don't be rude and hateful and mean to people because it doesn't solve anything. It's just not the way to go, you guys. I appreciate all of you being so courteous and kind with me. I appreciate the manners you use when you make posts on on YouTube and on my podcast. So thank you guys very much. Have a great day, everybody, and I will see you guys again, I promise. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past.